Uh, John, I do want to start off here uh, with what Caroline was getting to. The idea here that some of the supply chain issues may have peaked. We may have seen some degree of easing in some of those log jams. Are we seeing that on the ground at the ports? Yes, things are definitely getting better on the ground at the ports and throughout the supply chain. But we're not letting our guard down. Uh, we need to actually build on the gains we've made over the last couple of months in bringing fluidity back to the supply chain, uh, where we're uh, where it's moving about 20% more in the way of goods than it did before the pandemic. John, it was interesting, of course, that we were about a month or so ago at the port of Long Beach talking to all the individual sort of parts that are played, talking to the people at the ports, talking to the truckers, talking to the various associations. And what they called out again and again is how you'd help bring them together. This was sort of unprecedented in their mind's eye. But are they working together? Yes, you have 24-hour ports, but what else needs to work to ensure that the private part of all of this works in unison a little bit more from the public help that you're giving? Well, I think that's exactly right. The most important role that we've been playing uh, is, is to be an honest broker and bring the parties together, to move from finger pointing at different parts of the supply chain to common problem solving. And we're all in that problem solving mode. Uh, we meet three times a week, uh, early in the morning Pacific time, to uh, go through issues and, and, and work through them. Uh, we're working on every bit of the supply chain because it's only as strong as its weakest link. Um, and the really good news uh, is that moving forward, we now have the bipartisan infrastructure legislation which provides funding for badly needed infrastructure, whether it's at ports, inland, uh, rail, uh, trucking, or any other part of the, of the transportation system uh, that will help today, but most importantly, build the kind of goods movement chain that will help our children and grandchildren. It's interesting, though. Some of the reporting that we've done on the ground says that the number of ships that are anchored off the ports hasn't actually improved. We've just done a better job of pushing them out further into the ocean so they're outside the area where we're counting the ships. So we're asking people to slow down the ships that are coming into the port. Are you seeing that at all? Uh, well, it's a great question to ask. And first, uh, the new vessel queuing system has great air pollution reduction benefits. Rather than having every ship race to get to San Pedro Bay uh, and then sit there for three or four weeks, uh, uh, spewing pollution on adjacent neighborhoods all the time, uh, they're now assigned berthing uh, in Los Angeles or Long Beach when they leave the port that they originated from. Uh, so it's a much more effective system. But counting the number of ships, uh, I would argue uh, is probably the least valuable way of, of actually measuring the progress. The number of containers moved is what counts. Uh, there's considerable evidence that uh, the increase in ships is partly attributed to new smaller entrants with very small ships, maybe 3,000 TEUs as opposed to 22,000 TEUs uh, actually uh, entering into the trades. We want more competition, we welcome them, uh, but we should be measuring the number of containers moved, not the number of ships. So, well, let's talk a little bit more about that, particularly with some of those empty containers here. We've heard uh, from a lot of these uh, trucking representatives who talked about this idea here that the rules there maybe just need to be changed, if not temporarily, maybe even permanently to avoid these types of issues. Uh, yes, we've had great success with the uh, potential to impose a fee on long-dwelling imported containers, containers coming into America that sit on the docks for nine days or more. We've never actually assessed that fee, but the ability to it, the threat of it, uh, has actually helped considerably. Uh, as of January 30th, we will be able to do the same for empty containers uh, going out of the country. So that will not apply to U.S. exports, uh, manufacturing, agricultural, or others, uh, but just to empty containers that are taking up valuable real estate uh, at the ports. Uh, it, clearly, uh, this is a goods movement system that on the ports, inland and throughout the entire chain needs to work together more closely than it has in the past. Talk to us about the weakest point. You said the supply chain is only as good as its weakest point. You're getting on the phone three times a week bringing together the private sector. What is the weakest point? What can be fixed ultimately to make a smoother process of 2022? 
Well, the, uh, I think the reality is we have many weak links, uh, and uh, the, the pandemic laid bare the underlying reality, which was we had a good supply system that was just creaking along and barely functioning uh, in the best of times. And any kind of economic upset or natural disaster uh, would bring it to its knees. Uh, so every step of the way, uh, whether it's maritime, uh, with rail, trucking, distribution centers, the last mile, uh, getting to, the, to your store or your front door, every part of that uh, needs improvement. And that's the lifeblood of our economy. This is a private sector system uh, that uh, government acting as honest broker has been able to overcome some of these short-term issues. Now we need to pivot forward, look at the future, build a much more durable goods movement chain which, with much better information sharing among the private sector actors. Is part of that solution more onshoring, fewer imports? A absolutely. Uh, we believe there's a strong case to be made uh, uh, for whether it's semiconductors uh, or uh, other um, uh, valuable items that reshoring manufacturing in America is not only viable, uh, it's, it's in the nation's interest.